we're going to look at the, the why, the how, the who, and the when of being spirit-filled. So I'm anticipating this is going to be a great month of interaction with the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit is up to. Here is our telos for the entire month. The Holy Spirit is a real person who wants to engage with me. So maybe you could just jot that down, and put it on your fridge, or put it on your phone so you remember it throughout the month. The Holy Spirit is a real person who wants to engage with me. The Holy Spirit's not an it. The Holy Spirit is not a force. The Holy Spirit's not an inanimate object. The Holy Spirit is a real person who wants to engage with me. So, why take an entire month to talk about the Spirit? What's so important about the Spirit that we are going to take an entire month to talk about Him? Well, if you have your Bibles or your phones, I'd like to encourage you to go to John chapter 16. We're going to use this kind of as our um, uh, theme verses for the month. John chapter 16, verses 5 to 15. And I'm going to read this out of the New King James Version. The work of the Holy Spirit. This is Jesus who's speaking in uh, the upper room where they celebrated the, uh, the Passover just before they go to the garden where Jesus surrenders to the will of the Father and uh, his passion begins and he is crucified. John chapter uh, 16, verse 5. But now I go away to him who sent me and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled you your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is for your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. Hmm. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, will come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Oh, we're going to spend a whole month with the Holy Spirit. A number of questions that I want to kind of clear up right at the beginning. Uh, is spirit stuff or spirit talk optional? You know, uh, maybe we just want to say, ah, maybe, maybe I don't want to talk that much about the Holy Spirit. I want to talk about other things. Uh, uh, how about this? Isn't, isn't a lot of talk of the Spirit kind of like being denominational? Uh, and by denominational, uh, I mean, you know, Lifehouse is Pentecostal. And so myself and some other preachers this month, we're going to be preaching spirit stuff. Are we doing it because we're Pentecostal? Uh, I don't know if you know this, but on uh, the 23rd of March, it's Pentecost Sunday. So are we doing it for that reason? Uh, how about this? I'm fine. The Holy Spirit, well... A, he's the great unknown, and to be honest with you, Peter, ah, 
he makes me a little uncomfortable. Uh, at least the people who are really known as Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit people, well, they kind of make me a little uncomfortable. As a matter of fact, you know what? They look and act a little bit disturbed. Uh, they, <laughs> they look and act a little crazy. So, so no thank you. You know what? Uh, to be honest with you, I'm really good with Jesus. I like Jesus. I, I'm really good with the Father, but whoa, the spirit stuff? Uh, well, well, you know what? No, thank you. Um, I, I tell you what, uh, the spirit can do what he wants to other people, but eh, you know what? I'm fine, and maybe you could, you know, leave me alone. Well, let's talk about Jesus for a minute. Well, what does the church think about Jesus? What do you think about Jesus? What do I think about Jesus? Well, um, let me ask you a few questions about Jesus, okay? Here we go. If it was possible to have Jesus move next door to you, would you want that to happen? Good question. How about this? If it was possible for Jesus to literally physically show up at your house at 6 p.m., would you want that? I'm sure you're thinking... Yeah, uh, I, I'm good with that. Oh, oh, here's a good one. Is if this was possible, if you could have Jesus texts, text number, and any time you really wanted something, you could actually text Jesus, and he would text you right back. Jesus, should I eat spaghetti or fish for supper? And Jesus texts back, make it spaghetti tonight. Wouldn't that be quite something if you could actually text Jesus? Jesus. Again, have you ever thought about this? Can you imagine what it was like to be Peter, James, or John? Imagine, imagine you're, you're out fishing and Jesus said, hey, have you, any, have you caught anything? And, and you say, well, no. And so Jesus says, cast your net on the other side. You do it and you, you haul in 153 fish. Can you imagine what it was like to be Peter, James, and John experiencing that? How about this? It's the feeding of the 5,000. And you take your empty basket to Jesus, and he drops one little uh, uh, crumb in or a little uh, a piece of bread into your basket. And before your very eyes, it starts reproducing. And all of a sudden, your whole basket is full of bread. Wouldn't that be absolutely incredible? So you know what? Jesus is number one. Who wouldn't want to be closer to Jesus, right? Uh, who wouldn't want to have Jesus over for supper, right? Yeah, I'd like Jesus over for supper. Who, who wouldn't want Jesus in your home when your children are sick or, or you're not well and, and Jesus is in the living room? <laughs> and so you go, Jesus, my back hurts, my foot hurts, my, my child's got a cold. Wouldn't it be something to have Jesus in your living room all the time? Or how about this? I think it'd be a riot to take Jesus on holiday to see him water skiing or fishing with him. I, I just think that'd be absolutely fabulous. So you know what? Jesus is great. We like Jesus, and the idea of being with Jesus is good. Let's go back to our text, John chapter 16, verse 7. And Jesus said this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's for your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him. Okay, this is a head scratcher. I tell you the truth, it's for your advantage. King James uses the word expedient. It has this idea of being advantageous. It has the idea of being profitable or useful. So Jesus said, it's advantageous for you that I go away. So uh, I slam on the, the slam on the brakes and say, no, no, no. We've just figured out that we like Jesus, correct? We've just figured out that to have Jesus over for supper would be really something. To have Jesus in our living room would be really something. To have him show up at 6 o'clock would be really something. And then Jesus comes along and says, listen, you people, it's, it's expedient 
it's to your advantage that I go away. And I have to be honest with you, I read that and I go, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> that It doesn't sound right. How can it be better for me that Jesus is not coming over for supper tonight? How can that be better for me? That doesn't make sense. And I'm sure the disciples were looking at Jesus and they were saying, mm, Jesus, no, that doesn't make sense. So let's look at more. L look at this more. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage or expedient, uh, King James, uh, that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come. Now, the helper, you may know this, is a Greek word called, uh, translated parakletos. I'll show you in the next slide. And it, it's made up of two words, and it literally means one who is called alongside of us. One who is called alongside of us. One who is a mediator. One who is an intercessor. One who is a helper. One who appears on behalf of another. So here it is, parakletos. Now, Jesus is called the parakletos. And we are pretty familiar with this. This is in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Jesus is called the parakletos. We read these words. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have a parakletos. The New King James Version translates the term advocate. We have an advocate. We have a parakletos. And the parakletos speaks to the Father. So here we go. If anyone sins, we have one called alongside of us, Jesus. The, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, but not only for ours, the sins of the whole world. So Jesus is our legal lawyer. Jesus is standing before the Father and he is one who's called alongside of us, and he's called to speak to the Father in our defense. So we are the product of the intercessory ministry of Jesus. Jesus is exalted to the right hand of the Father. He is seated on the right hand of the Father, and he's interceding to the Father on behalf of me and on behalf of you. Now, let's get back to John. Jesus calls the Holy Spirit a parakletos. Jesus is the parakletos, one called alongside of us to, the, to speak to the Father in our defense. The Holy Spirit here, Jesus says, is our parakletos. So, get ready. This is the key thing for us to grab. The Holy Spirit was destined to take the place of Jesus. The Holy Spirit was destined to take the place of Jesus. After Jesus' ascension to the Father, the Holy Spirit would come. He would lead the disciples into deeper knowledge of the truth, the gospel truth. He would give them divine strength to undergo trials and persecution. He is the one called alongside of them. Now, Jesus has been trying to get this through to them. If you go up or you go back a couple of chapters, John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verses 16 to 18. Jesus said, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper another parakletos he will send you or he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever the holy spirit is going to abide with you forever 
The Holy Spirit is going to take the place of Jesus and abide with you forever. This spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Verse 18 of John 14, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So you have to ask yourself this question. Well, well, how exactly is the Holy Spirit coming to the disciples if he's ascended? He's coming through the person of the Holy Spirit. So for Jesus, this is what he wants his disciples to grasp. What I am to you, the Spirit will be to you. What I am to you, the Holy Spirit will be to you. So, I asked you a bunch of questions about Jesus. Do you want him in your living room? Do you want to be able to text him? Do you want to bring him on vacation? Do you want to see him water skiing? <laughs> do, you, uh, do you want to ask him if you want to eat uh, spaghetti or what was it saying? Fish, right? And what Jesus wants us to know is this. You can. You can do all of those things by having a relationship with the Holy Spirit. I just need you to settle on that for a while. So what Jesus was to Peter, James, and John, to Mary, to Martha, to Lazarus, what Jesus was to those people, Jesus is or can be to us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Gordon Smith says this, the Spirit has come in place of the bodily presence of Jesus. And so the church follows Christ only in so far as it intentionally responds to the Spirit. The Spirit has come in the place of the bodily presence of Jesus. So, we don't have the bodily presence of Jesus in our living room or knocking at our door at 6 o'clock or eating supper with us, but he has sent the Spirit, and when we listen and respond to the Spirit, we have, this is incredible, we have as much of Jesus as Lazarus did. We have as much of Jesus as Peter did when we have the Holy Spirit. The genius of the Christian life, more from Gordon T. Smith, the genius of the Christian life is the resolve, the willingness, and the capacity to personally, to, pardon me, to respond personally and intentionally to the Spirit's promptings. So when we learn to listen to the Spirit's wooings, when we learn to uh, listen to the Spirit's voice and the Spirit's promptings, as we listen to the Holy Spirit, we're actually listening to Jesus. It's like opening the door and there's Jesus. Say, oh, hi, Jesus. Come on in and we'll have a cup of coffee together and we'll have the spaghetti together that we ordered, okay? It's the same as doing that when we listen and walk with the Spirit because the Spirit is to us what Jesus was to Martha. To be a Christian, then, is to walk in, in the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit, to respond to the Spirit who transforms us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. One more time. To be a Christian is to walk in the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit, to respond to the Spirit who transforms us into the image of Christ. Why talk about the Spirit? Well, when you talk about the Spirit, you're, you're indirectly talking about Jesus because the Holy Spirit has come to bring us Jesus. So let's go back to our text. This is John uh, 16, verse 17. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's for your advantage. It's, it's for your, it's, it's expedient 
uh, that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So, here we go. Jesus said, if I ascend, if I go away, when I get to where I'm going, I am going to dispatch the Holy Spirit to you with the intention of purposefully communicating with you. Okay, one more time. When I get up there, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. This is what the word send means. It's the Greek word pempo. It means this, to dispatch someone, whether human or transcendent, usually for the purposes of communication. So, John's gospel uh, is full of this thought. Jesus is the sent one. Jesus is the one sent by God. But here we have the Spirit dispatching the Spirit to us. The Spirit has been dispatched to us so that He will communicate with us and speak to us and tell us what Jesus wants us to know. Huh. Why spend a month with the Holy Spirit? Well, because indirectly, we're spending a month talking to Jesus. In short, this series that we're going to do is the hows, the whos, and the whens of the Spirit. Well, why the Spirit? Well, because the Spirit replaces Jesus for us. I'm not sure that we understand that, and I think you can only receive it by revelation. The more you surrender to the Spirit, the more you have Christ within. The more Spirit we surrender to, the more Spirit we walk with, the more Spirit we acknowledge, we listen to, we agree with, the more of Jesus that we have. So, we need to talk just in conclusion very quickly. Well, where is the Spirit? The number one thing that we have to wrestle with is this. And I think this is picked up from the King James a little bit. Um, I grew up on the King James version of the Scripture, and we read the terminology, the Holy Ghost. So you have this idea of ghost. Well, uh, when I was a kid, you could watch Casper the Friendly Ghost on TV. Uh, and a ghost is someone that walks through walls, right? And uh, so the Holy Spirit is a ghost. And so because he's a ghost, you have this, or you can't tend to have this kind of thinking that the Holy Spirit is spooky, right? <laughs> um, and uh, he's kind of like buzzing around, you know. A and people say, whoa, did you feel the spirit? And uh, you get the idea that he kind of just kind of floats in, kind of flies in, kind of floating around. But I want to tell you, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we're talking about someone who lives inside of you if you're a believer. The Bible says to us in John chapter 3, a very familiar passage of Scripture, Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, Unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that, that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So I always tell people this. When you become a Christian, you are born again by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the one who comes inside of you and creates the born-again experience with you. Now, one of the problems that we have as Pentecostals is we use metaphors that we've taken from the book of Acts. So, the book of Acts uses this metaphor. The Holy Spirit came upon them. So, you have this idea that the Holy Spirit's kind of floating around up here, and kaboom, he uh, comes and settles down upon you. Or the Holy Spirit is uh, poured out. So, the idea the Holy Spirit's up there, and he, he kind of 
comes down in, these, in this symbol of a water. Uh, we talk about the Holy Spirit's like rain. And all of these metaphors are, um, are helpful for us, but they're also, uh, they're also confusing for us because the Holy Spirit is not up there, although he is. Uh, the Holy Spirit is within inside of me. Romans chapter 8 says it this way, for as many as are led by the Spirit, uh, uh, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. Verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. So, I am a child of God. Well, how do I know that? Well, there's a bunch of reasons I know it. But the primary reason is my spirit bears witness with God's spirit because my spirit has been raised, saved, cleansed, born again. And my spirit connects with God's spirit because my spirit is within me and God's spirit is within me. And my spirit bears witness with God's spirit. So, because he is on the inside of me, I'm called to look after my inner life. I'm called to look after my heart, my soul, because this is the place where the Spirit dwells. The worship team is going to come. I'm almost done. This is the place where the Spirit dwells. And as we walk, listen carefully, as we walk and mature, we walk with the Spirit and Christ is formed within us. I still have many things to say to you, Jesus is telling the disciples, but you cannot bear them now. So what he means by that is there are things that they will get to know as they mature in their faith. They'll get clearer revelation the longer they walk in the Spirit. And so Jesus said, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you in all truth. I want to know more of the spirit. And so the spirit is going to guide me in all truth because he's not going to speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he speaks. And he will tell you of things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine. He'll declare to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I say that he will take of mine and he will declare it to you.